then the tickets were called Mr. and Mrs. Bass Fiddle. <laughs> and because they were too big, we were in the front of the uh, of the airplane where the seats were bigger. Mm-hmm. And then we were having the champagne of uh, for ourselves and also for Mr. and Mrs. Bass Fiddle. <laughs> It's such a pleasure to connect with people that I've been following along with for years, and that is totally the case with today's guests. I'm Jason Heath. This is Controversy Conversations, and we're talking today with Hans Rolofsen and Rudolf Sen, who have for decades made up the bass duo. They have toured the world with 15 trips to the United States alone and have acquired many good stories in the process. So I connect with them both in their homes over Skype while we're all locked away during this pandemic. So, of course, that comes up, but we also talk about how they got to be a duo, the challenge of transcription, how choosing a particular key affects so many things for an arrangement and just so many other things. Such a fun conversation. I know you're going to enjoy hearing from them. And if you aren't signed up for the International Online Bass Summit, we've got a few more days for that. BassSummit.org is the website. So definitely check that out. And I would love to see you and hundreds of other bass players there. Okay, let's dig into this conversation with Hans Rolofsen and Rudolf Sen, the bass duo. Hello. Yes. yes. <laughs> Good to see you. Yes. How are you? And I think Rudolph's on the line too, right? Hey, yeah. there we go. All there right. He hey, great to see both of you. Wow. Look at that. And you got your bases in the background and everything. This is perfect. <laughs> yes. Okay. Good. Remind me, what time of day is it for you right now? Is it like 4 p.m.? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Four o'clock in the afternoon. It's a comfortable time as opposed to your seven o'clock in the morning. Jesus. Ex- yeah. Exactly. But I'm an, I'm an early bird. I like it. It, it. it means I go to bed at like 7 p.m., but uh, but it's <laughs> otherwise. So I hope, I hope you're both passing the time okay. Uh, Yes. No problem. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Do you want to know how things are going here, Jason? I would love to. I would love to know. I, I think it's really. Yeah. Please tell me. We can uh, visit friends, and uh, if you invite a couple for dinner, it's two by two, and outdoor the weather is perfect. So social life is actually quite normal. Only not groups, no concerts. I do miss the chamber music concerts in our home. And actually, as a grandfather, I miss my grandchildren most. Ah. I I didn't see them. Here you go. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That's hard. That's hard. Yeah. Especially to make them understand, probably. Yeah. They don't understand. Why can't we go to grandpa? It was so fun. Yeah. It's only by, by Skype or by Zoom. That we yeah. get to see them. Yeah, it's 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 got to be especially hard for for children to to understand. And it's been my 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 wife and I don't have kids, but I have a lot of friends that do, and I have a lot of friends with young kids at home right now. And so it's uh, they're spending a lot more time with their kids than they were expecting. <laughs> Time to practice music with them. Huh? Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, how, how long? So I, I live in San Francisco, and we've been shut down for over a month now. When when did things start to go into effect in the Netherlands? Maybe maybe actually there was a, a, a Rudolf knows him. Geert Mack was going to give a lecture, and they expected more than hundred visitors. And uh, that was on March 10, but he canceled at, at uh, the very There were al- already signs of uh, something big coming our way. Yeah. And gradually, at first, uh, early March, they said, well, better not shake hands. And then they, it, it came eventually to uh, uh, keeping a, a good distance to people. Yeah. So yeah, we're now practicing being friendly and not touching being friendly from a distance, and uh, well, that's a challenge. You have to do it with words and gestures rather than touching. No touching, except for a small group. We had strength started here on March 7, and without any worries yet, that was fantastic. But that was the last one. 
it, it's it's incredible because uh, that seems so recent, but it's similar for me. My my last trip was March third. I was coming from Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, and back to here. And I remember we were. I don't even think the coronavirus came up uh, in conversation, really. You know, may, maybe it was on the news, but I think here in the states, I mean, I think Europe had with Italy and the break, outbreak there. I think it was probably closer to home for you. But then I remember my wife and I went out for dinner, maybe March 6th. And that was the first time, you know, people were a little concerned. And then within a few days, uh, yeah, everything, everything shut down. Yeah. 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 Well, it'll be uh, some time before we get uh, concerts again. Huh? It's, yeah. it's, it seems as if uh, every... Uh, we, uh, big... we have the next concert plan for June 13. Yeah. But it might be... Doubtful, uh, doubtful, uh, I think. I would plan, say. But it might be that it will be uh, only without audience or maybe a handful to give Musa Robatsky to the feeling that it's a real recital. Maybe... Yeah do it on local television. Yeah, I was just watching. I, it's interesting to watch how these different ensembles or different groups are trying to figure it out. I I just watched this morning the Philadelphia Orchestra uh, is they were they did a series of string quartets and so and it, it's kind of interesting to look into people's houses and to see um, you know just just how people are trying to figure it out and these highly skilled musicians but they're recording on their phone and it's just it's very interesting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Anyway, we, we, you uh, were we, mentioning Pittsburgh. Yeah, I'm assuming. I mean, you you were saying 15 trips you did to the United States alone. Yes. Well, uh, Pittsburgh. Wow. Pittsburgh was also one of the cities we visited. Mm -hmm. yeah. And actually, we have fond memories uh, because when your uh, our manager was Del Rosenfield, and we w were never in hotels, always in private addresses friends of the orchestra, and so uh, our view of the United States is very rosy because uh, people that host uh, guest musicians, well, they felt for us like Europeans, the same uh, interests, and uh, people who are successful in their, in their um, uh, professional life, but also are supporters of the orchestra, that's actually a, a fantastic uh, selection of people to meet. Yeah, absolutely. Although at times uh, uh, I remember Hans saying, well, his political ideas are wonderful, but why doesn't he clean his, the shower better? Because <laughs> <laughs> that happens. <laughs> Sometimes you find homely situations, and then we would prefer the more um, yeah. right-wing person who had a swimming pool in his house. <laughs> <laughs> there are, there are yeah. positives, positives and negatives to all the situations. But I, I love tra be stay, you know, I think when I'm going to travel, I think I want the hotel because I think I want the convenience and the predictability. But all my favorite experiences traveling have been when I'm staying in other people's homes and you get such a great. I remember traveling to Japan and staying in a uh, fa uh, family's home in Sapporo and just how much richer my experience was. It's really cool that you both did that. You get to know people, and actually, uh, we had the privilege to visit the um, United States from El Paso to uh, Anchorage, Alaska, and from Washington to San Francisco. So that was actually wonderful. And sometimes uh, in Europe, they think uh, culture is less important, but we were one time, Rudolf remembers this very well, in Olympia. And we were surprised. We played two concerts for um, Carmel High School. Mm -hmm. And um, we were totally amazed that all the youngsters, I think there were 1,800 and in three shifts, we played three times with the, uh, the symphony orchestra of that school. And we were totally amazed that the audience was so attentive. They didn't need any uh, loud instruction or explanation, we could just play. And uh, so this was an experience which we didn't have in Europe. And we asked the parents later, how is this possible? 
they said um, 10 years ago there was um, uh, uh, violence problems with red uh, trousers uh, or shirts and, and blue shirts and they were uh, kicking each other literally to death. And then the parents decided that every child would have a musical lesson, one hour, every day. And um, you could pick your instrument. There were big bands, uh, uh, two orchestras. So a lot of music. And actually, the goal to make the children less violent succeeded. Uh, and it is less likely to start using drugs because that was another side of that yes. problem i remember yes. that yep. there was an army base there we're talking uh, i think uh, spokane washington that was the state if i remember well or olympia you say olympia and well, anyway yeah. washington yeah. state yeah. And, uh, and then uh, they said we need to to see that they don't roam the streets and they they, uh, they have to do something. So they integrated the pro program, music program in the schools. And uh, one school starts and, and the others join. And this was all started with singing and then the instrument came afterwards and they eventually they formed uh, groups, larger groups. And uh, they encountered a problem that apparently very few kids chose the double bass, so they they picked us from our uh, glossy uh, magazine where, where, where our manager had put uh, ads yearly, and uh, they said, hey, two basses, and they have a solo program, why don't we get them to do to come here and uh, promote the double bass? So that's what happened, and we got a chance to uh, play our heads off and play the both C double three times after another, but there were other pieces. I remember you played uh, Paul Nidre with yes. the orchestra, so we, we did give them a one one second of, uh, of attention away from our instrument. And, uh, and it was quite a, it was a challenge, of course, we were used to it by that time, but, uh, and it was fun. And uh, afterwards, uh, we were able to um, make, uh, um, make people meet, like there came professional double bass players, and we said, hey, you're here, it's not too far, why don't you uh, uh, have, have the kids, teach the kids, and so it was apparently helpful for them, and it was great fun to do that. Yeah. Wow. In, those days, in those days, Jason, uh, the routine was um, you bought a ticket, uh, one is over the ocean, and then for $100 each was a destination uh, uh, inside the USA. So the larger distances we did by airplane, and we had special aluminum cases uh, around the bases, and... Um, so they could be inside the airplane and not not inside with us. What has happened as well? Then the tickets were called Mr. and Mrs. Bass Fiddle. <laughs> and because they were too big, we were in the front of the uh, of the airplane where the seats were bigger. Mm -hmm. And then we were having the champagne of uh, for ourselves and also for Mr. and Mrs. Bass Fiddle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I still, I still remember Hans that you I sp took care to dress especially well because probably you expected something like this happening because if you, if you imagine a double bass, full double bass in a in a cover in a in an economy uh, seat, that's utterly impossible. So I think he, it was his. his yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's have fun. But imagine Jason that so the the big dance distances were with airplane five destinations and the small uh, trips we would call anything what we call um, uh, 2000 kilometers uh, mm -hmm. let's say 50, 1200 16 1500 miles mm -hmm. then we drove together and um, uh, when we went downhill somewhere, there was always a, a policeman with a speed gun. <laughs> bear, a bear in the grass. <laughs> yeah. Cool. yeah. Okay. We and were he, stopped and there was a discussion. Yes. And, and we said to our manager, send them to, uh, to Europe and we put them in the oven. <laughs> <laughs> went well. Yeah. But... 
all these long trips, of course, we, we are, had always fun uh, discussing uh, a day trip. And uh, I think there was hardly a free day. And one time, I, we had been with uh, this uh, psych, uh, psychiatrist. We played there um, in, on a podium over a swimming pool. You remember, Rudolf? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He was, uh, afterwards, with he was making a little extra money hosting parties. <laughs> yeah. And so this was a party for the... This was in New York, actually. Mm -hmm. I, I think it was in Washington. Or DC, because the party we played, we get to, got to play, was for the Dutch Embassy. Yes. So we, we were the Dutch street, and they put the podium over the swimming pool, and uh, there were lights uh, floating around you, and we got to play there for... Yeah, it was... <laughs> we had two programs, actually. Uh, one was... Uh, with uh, no, actually three. One was with piano accompaniment or harpsichord or both, if we had the chance. And uh, and of course we had our uh, uh, concerts with orchestra. And then we had a program that we did by ourselves, the two of us, which was like uh, very suited for for a concert in a museum or or on, on this occasion uh, on the universities platform. Yeah. yeah. So, and we did it so often that uh, we played the whole program, an hour's program, by heart. Wow. At some point. No problem. Yeah. Actually, it would have been more difficult to put the notes because we you have to turn page and where you're looking. We just, oops, and we played it and started and uh, wonderful, fun. Yeah. Oh, I, would, I would love to see a photo. Of, I, I, I wonder if anybody has a photo of that on that platform. That's such a great, that's such a great image. <laughs> What they, the evening unforgettable for me was afterwards we were in this. Do you remember his name of this doctor? Oh, no, I don't. He, uh, he had a jacuzzi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was there with Vaughn, but uh, there must have been uh, terrible bacteria because I got so terribly ill. <laughs> and then uh, I had to play every evening, and that was okay, the playing itself. But sometimes a pre concert talk. That was okay, but after the concert and meeting the, the yeah. important people, that was then really hard for me to do yeah. because I needed to recuperate some days and we didn't cancel any uh, concert whatsoever. But that no, was uh, never. No. Yeah, that, that was also unforgettable. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. How, how on earth did you? How on earth did you two get started doing this? I mean, because what a cool! I was looking up, um, because I've 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 listened to you. You both play. I mean, your your uh, your duo is like I've been familiar with both your names for years. And I and I went into Base World magazine. I was looking. I was looking at Jeff Bradditch doing a review of one of your uh, either concerts or albums. I forget, but from the 1985 maybe or something like that. So like, how how did you get how how did you get started doing that? I know we. I know that you were you were stand partners, right? Uh, how how did that all start? Oh, I think already in school, Hans was uh, was studying in the United States, and he played uh, with uh, his teacher Gary Carr some duets, and then he came home and he said, "Hey, this is fun, uh, but I think we can do it uh, with a more stylistic, uh, accurate accuracy." Uh, this was uh, about the Handel trio sonata that we have uh, done very often since and recorded. And uh, so it, we just started off and uh, we were actually uh, in school still, wow. so or, or just after. Yeah, actually we met in 72 when I came to Amsterdam yeah. and Rudolf was quite an established student. I, yeah. was, I was a half wild man coming from <laughs> pop music and playing the bass guitar. Yeah. And Rudolf played guitar and double bass. And so I was the newcomer, the new kid on the block. And actually quite uh, uh, extroverted. And instead of um, uh, looking jealously uh, at each other, for me, um, contact and, and just how do you do that, these kind of conversations, listening to each other, seeing what the other does, we sublimated our rivalry in friendship. And I think that um, um, had fantastic results 
because also when we were uh, co-partners uh, in Utrecht, in the Utrecht Symphony Orchestra, we uh, were able to buy new basses or good basses for our group. And most of the things we uh, tested were always like listening in the hall to the other person playing the instrument, judging bows, not with your own subjective feeling, but listening to a bow, how it speaks when you are uh, like 20 feet, uh, sorry, 20 meters away, 15 meters away. So yeah. that I think this, um, this trial and error system has uh, been uh, very beneficial. Yeah, and it's helpful if you have uh, worked on a, if you have a relationship where there is trust. I mean, obviously, if, if just somebody asks you to listen in on something, you, you want to be a little polite and so on and so forth. We had all this behind us, so it was just very, very precise, you know, and, and no, no cheating. If you judge a bow, you turn the other way and say, no, this is, this is bow A. Uh, you have to test your ears also. This, this must be bow A. And, and, oh, no. Oh, I, I, I changed my mind. That's, that's no, A. And so we worked out differences and uh, that you develop uh, things that work out to the present day, like a heavier bow and uh, longer. Uh, yeah. and, and does it work? What does a heavier bow create in terms of sound? Will you play fast notes? Will you play legato? This was all uh, part of our... Uh, of our work, but uh, it never, never felt like work actually, but uh, it's, I call it work now. <laughs> and, and, and academically speaking, uh, Rudolf was my peer. So he, um, he was a better kid in school. And um, I, I, for me from age 14, when I picked up the bass guitar, because I had a friend who played the guitar already brilliantly, uh, learning by ear was actually the first thing. Um, before that, I've been a bugle player in a brass band, and that was the only culture in a little provincial village. And so, um, being drawn to pop music, everything goes by ear. So, uh, the, the contrast with uh, Rudolf's skills, which were more learning music by notes, uh, is another approach, another feeling. I think the interaction has worked very well because you could say somehow as a former pop musician, uh, I, I would consider myself to be uh, um, a bit rude. No nonsense, this is it, and oh no, these details you don't hear. So uh, down to earth. And um, so the combination, because even when you give your opinion in a rude way, you always want the other to make it, to fine tune the gross results. And this mutual trust, I think, has been very, very fruitful. Yeah. You yeah, want to for, for me, for me it, it created uh, more, more liberty, although I must say that I started off playing jazz after, my, after I played the classical guitar. Uh, jazz was the next station where I had the bass, so I still do that. If I learn something new, I prefer to play it uh, pizzicato at first, to have your left hand in order and then take the, pick up the bow. But I think with playing with Hans in duo, uh, what always helped me was listening. I mean, I, I imitate, you, we have this uh, CD that you may know of the, of the French Rococo music, where there's one line, the second is an imitation to, to this. And uh, so what you do, playing by ear is uh, what, what you need to do. I mean, uh, obviously there are problems to solve, but this should never get in the way of, uh, of, your, of the ear. And uh, I think we've been quite successful in that way. That's uh, it is the best way to play for me also, by ear. 
how how did you so what uh, I'd love to know just like doing all these tours and I'm assuming you went you went around Europe as well not just the United States um, but like how maybe maybe just uh, you were you were talking a little bit about that program like like an hour's worth of music that you that you played by heart like what did that change over time or what were some what were some of the pieces that you were typically playing I'm sure you had quite a variety that you were drawing from. Yeah, well, it, it uh, was from 18th century music, the Rococo stuff, but also Mozart uh, duo for um, bassoon and cello, um, pieces from uh, Brug for clarinet and viola, so um, uh, Atterberg suite for violin and viola. So it is actually uh, listening to music and then thinking, hey, we could play that. We've been playing in the Concertgebouw a Bach double concerto for violin and hobo. Uh, and after listening to the results, uh, we had fun doing it, but we could also say afterwards, nah, that's not as good as we hoped it would be. Yeah. And, and that's not only about if we could uh, play the notes well, but how it would sound with the orchestra. Mm. Some pieces sound good. Uh, if you think of my uh, uh, finding uh, Glazunov, uh, Chant de Menestrel, uh, it sounds very well with piano. And I wanted to play it as an encore in the Concertgebouw with the orchestra of Vilnius. And listening to myself with the orchestra in the background, I thought, no. It's not, it doesn't distinguish the solo instrument enough. So sometimes you find pieces for cello that you can play an octave lower on the bass, Glazunov Elegy and Glazunov Chant de Ministrel, with piano, very good, but with orchestra, not. Mm -hmm. So uh, with this Bach thing, of course it was fun to play it, Bach's music is beautiful, but it's not always sure that the end result with an orchestra will be to our satisfaction. Mm -hmm. So you have to uh, play a hundred pieces and, and save some that are really effective in that combination. Well, and then after this selection, there also came a, a phase where we find that the piece that we had been playing and uh, maybe, and then I get a phone call from Hans and he says, hey, try this, Mozart, uh, uh, one tone uh, lower, instead of D, try it in C, and see what you think. So I, after an hour, I say, well, good idea, lovely, we do it, do it in C. And so we have to, it, it being in the computer, it makes it easy to change the keys. And uh, also for a lot of pieces that we recorded on the on the Barmoche uh, CD as the Rococo pieces, we tried in several keys, and and then we we went for the key that was good, sounded best, and uh, and had the practical uh, practical realization was possible. But, uh, but, uh, so uh, that's cool. and it's, it's an, uh, an ongoing process. It's, mm -hmm. It never stops. And, uh, the advantage I, when you know a piece by heart, uh, then you can you, you play it in a certain key, and then you doubt is this for the bass actually a good key? So you transpose it somewhere else, either visually or if you know it really by heart, you can also do it by ear. Yeah, and then if it turns out that you shift a half note, a whole tone, or uh, more than that, and if it works better in another key, it does more justice to the instrument. Uh, I think um, it's a failure. We have seen a lot of uh, not so good uh, transcriptions for the bass. Let's say all the Vivaldi sonatas, they were published an octave lower. Yeah. And um, so simply change the word cello and, uh, uh, and make bass and, and uh, fingerings by Fred Zimmerman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, this uh, IMC uh, publications. Right, right. Uh, and they, they become pieces that sound like etudes because they, they, don't, uh, they don't shine anymore. They're not bright and brilliant, but actually they're quite muddy. 
and then it feels a little bit like doing uh, orchestra excerpts. Um, we've had a, a good guy in the United States. He played the, uh, the piano quite well, and, and we heard him play some of the uh, Vivaldi sonatas, and we thought, wow, brilliantly, technically. But then uh, stylistically, and especially in the, in the um, altitude, was like, okay, that's a bad idea. And I was, uh, we, that was not so long ago, Rudolf, that was it 2015, we were in Colorado. Yeah, on the, yes. uh, and the that ISB was, convention. Yeah, yeah. I, I was amazed that still so many um, um, transcriptions in the wrong key are still played. Yeah, yeah. People blame themselves for for problems. Uh, sometimes it's easier to solve a problem uh, by changing the key. And if you have it in the computer, it's not difficult to change it. And uh, we have uh, our, Hans was mentioning him already, Vaughan, who is a, a brilliant uh, a pianist, harpsichordist, and r arranger, and so. And uh, we have we never hesitated to ask him. Well, of course we we ha have him. We invite him always if we play together or one of us plays, so he gets enough work. But uh, we've we've had uh, changes uh, that uh, oh he says I have it in uh, in F sharp, I have it in G, I have it in A. What which one should I bring? And he says okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, but it happened when I played. Uh, Vaughn, could we play it in another key tomorrow? Yeah. And then he just rearrange. And then he just puts a finger on the button, and you yeah. get it in another key. And uh, so that that experimental phase has been very fruitful as well. Yeah. yeah. And, and let me give you an example of what I did in my uh, final. Uh, Exam. I played the second uh, Bach suite um, at pitch, but then the stupid thing is, on the bass it sounds one note higher than on the cello because you play in solo key, right? Which, which is ridiculous. And but I've done that in my final exam in 1977, and I, I, actually I refused to play the uh, Eduard Nani etudes because I found it stupid music, and I asked the commission. Please, could I play decent music like Bach's suite? And nobody had done it in those days, so I played it at a pitch. And after and afterwards, being older and wiser, not sadder and wiser, um, my suggestion is you read bass cliff and change bass cliff for tenor cliff. Then, if you play in D, it sounds you play actually in A minor, the second suite. And with solo tuning, it sounds in B minor, which is a third lower than the cello uh, version. And then actually you have better chances, the instrument is more resonant, and people don't look at you like, oh, he would have loved, had loved to be uh, a cellist, but it's too late. And because I, I think it's uh, somehow people feel pity for you if you sweat over a piece that a second uh, year conservative student does much better on the cello than a master does it on the bass. Yeah, it's always a little strange to, to see that. And it's always a little strange to hear Bach on the bass a whole step higher than the original cello key. There's just something wrong about that, it, it, it seems. Uh, there's a, a wonderful bass player named uh, Young Ho Fu, who is principal bass of the, I forget the exact title of the orchestra, but the biggest orchestra in Taiwan. And he did, an, uh, he did a version of, of, I believe it's all six Bach suites. I have it here somewhere. And he did what you're describing, took took thought of it in bass clef, but put it in tenor clef, and it works quite well. Yes, yes. That's actually yeah. first transcriptions, a quart lower played, sounding a third lower. Uh, in 80% of the times, that's the best solution. Mm -hmm. oh. Because actually, my wife is a singer. Um, if you uh, take uh, songs by Schubert and Schumann, Brahms, 
you go to the library and they ask which version do you want? High voice, medium voice, low voice. So the same songs uh, are actually published in three keys. And um, uh, that's for, for a singer a natural thing to do. He wants to sing it in his own key. He's not going to uh, sing uncomfortably at the top of his, of his voice all the time. Then the expression, you lose expression actually. Yeah, that's right. That's I'm thinking about even like various opera arias and the like. You know, that's a that's a that's a common thing. It makes sense to think about it for for our instrument as well. Yeah, and I, I, uh, art song is published in three keys normally, only when it's maybe uh, really written uh, for let's say for Vogel, um, written by Schu uh, Schubert, that he was really thinking about an impressive low voice. Uh, their atlas, that, that's not for a soprano. But many uh, songs were published for Zangstime, Zingstime, so for a voice, and not especially for a certain voice. Now, let me give you another example. Think of um, uh, Vocalise by Rachmaninoff. And the violin plays it, it's originally for soprano. The violin plays it not in, in C, um, C sharp uh, minor, but in E minor because it's more comfortable on the violin. Now, someone uh, makes a, a publication for the cello in E minor, and then a bass player thinks, okay, I want to play the two, and he plays it in E minor, or maybe in D in solo tuning. But who says? Uh, and why do we take the same key as the others do when the original is in C sharp minor, the vocal uh, song? And so on the bass, you play it in A minor sounding in B, or you play it in B minor sounding in C sharp. So from the vocal uh, point, what you call art song, there's always this question, which uh, et tessitura do you have? Which voice? Because a voice is expressive if you start from the middle and you can expand in uh, going upward and downward. Downward is always is, uh, softer, weaker, and human voice weakens if they go low and they get uh, stronger if they go up, uh, provided that they don't sing falsetto. Mm -hmm. when, when they sing with their uh, uh, low voice and bring it up, it, it's getting louder and louder. With our instru instrument, we have one problem. The higher we go... On only. No. <laughs> <laughs> the higher I'm, we go... I'm hearing something new. No, I, I was thinking of the way we, we, uh, we teach uh, beginners or, or is start rather than the up in the uh, the end of the string, start in the middle, where you have the octave to the next string, and the spread of the fingers is less, and also checking your intonation is easier. You have an octave with the next string, so it's D on the G string, A on the D string, etc. And then if you, if you go uh, up one step, you have the octave, so you already have, with one position only, you have a, quite a decent range. And now also, this turns out to be a focal po point for a successful transcriptions. If you are in this position, more or less, and you go up, you have, need to have some thumb position, because otherwise it gets too muddy. Although with our latest uh, Mozart tr transcription of the duet, we hardly play the, 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 in the thumb position, but it's a bit, a bit on the, on the, on the edge of it. But uh, other works, it's, it's, so it's up. If you, if you look at the, I'm, I'm doing the Dragonetti waltzes again for a concert with, with a friend of mine who was, who was turning 80 and he's still playing. So we do the Rossini together. And uh, I thought it was nice to have uh, some of the, the waltzes before because uh, the Rossi, Rossini duet, as we, as we all know, is written for Dragonetti. So, and you find in his uh, works uh, that the upper, upper limit more or less the, the octave plus fifth 
and uh, he he goes all the way down to A because he he, he never had the E string as a fourth string. He was playing a, th a th three, three string. Yeah. But if you have the, if you have that c compass in your in your head, and that's the, the thing. So I I made my own uh, version of the Rossini uh, part because it's written for a double bass, as you as you know, in orchestra. Uh, orchestral tuning, and I want to play it in uh, in solo tuning. But also, this gives the opportunity to change things around. Hans and I have been experimenting with it in a version for two double basses, where we, again we change the key, and uh, and we found well, the bass part goes back here. No, why not? We go take it up. So it's 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 fun. It's a fun process, and then uh, we play it in it goes, G, yeah? sounding A. Yeah, we play it in, in G. Yeah. The cello is in D, and we play it uh, in G, sounding A. So. And the latest change that Hans came up with was changing the key of the uh, slow movement, of the middle movement. Yeah. We had to persuade uh, Vaughan. He was, f for the first time in his life, he was uh, protesting. <laughs> no, you know better than Rossini. And, uh, but, but. <laughs> I found that if you play it with cellists and you ask them politely, would you mind uh, taking this once a uh, half step down? And then it makes it so much easier for the double bass to play it. You suddenly have open strings and, uh, and harmonics. It's, uh, yeah. It's not, uh, yeah. It, has, it always has to sound easy. Yeah. And it, it is easier then. So. Natural. Yeah. Natural. Sometimes in, in, when I play it voluntarily in the Holocaust um, uh, Memorial, they uh, announce me as a cellist and I, I just let them think uh, it doesn't make a difference for them. They don't realize what the difference is. And no. for me it's like um, you have a tenor voice or a bass voice. You're a singer, yeah. Exactly. You both have to sound brilliant. Yeah. And actually, when I play Max Brug Colibre, I don't sweat because I, I feel in A minor, it sounds so natural. While when you play it in, in the original key in D, you have to sound uh, deeper, and which is dark and muddy, or you are too high and then it feels like insecure and not masculine. Yeah. And I heard it by a, a, a cantor in Amsterdam, Hans Blumendahl, and uh, when he sings it, it's A minor. Uh -huh. it, if you just follow the cello, you don't go back to the source. And the source was the, yeah. the Jewish ritual song, uh, uh, Kol Nidre, the day before Yom Kippur. So it, you have to represent a human voice, actually. Yeah. And, and yeah. keeping that in mind, also in the approach of our instrument, all the bass players feel comfortable if they can play boom, boom, very loud in low frequencies. But that kills the melodic uh, uh, power of a piece because actually when you are playing low notes, you should completely relax so they don't drown the high notes. And so you play almost nothing, it goes naturally, and you make an effort in the middle and you make twice the effort when you go in thumb positions. You have to use so much more bow to make it sound equal. The voice has to go up and down in a natural way. Yeah. And actually, uh, I'm, I'm afraid that still today, not many people do really care about that because they feel like, okay, we are bass players, so boom, boom, here we go. They feel actually, that's why sometimes we felt unhappy with bass meetings. You remember, Rudolf, when we went to Germany, when there were bass uh, week, weeks, and there was this guy who uh, died very young, uh, Ovidio Badila. Yeah. yeah. And he, he we played. We can only speak, uh, speak friendly about, about the dead, of course. But, uh... Yeah. <laughs> but so he played Bach in, in, so in, in a low key. And actually, Rudolf and I were shocked like, how can he do that? And so uh, use it in, in a really fat way. Uh, there was another German guy who played all the Bach suites, and, and I had two Brazilian students here, and I made them listen to it after they played uh, one of the suites themselves. And I said, uh, listen to this. What do you think? 
Who does the better job, you or this guy that plays all six? Sorry, teacher, I think I play it better. And so to, to be proud that you play all six suites, um, what did you achieve? Just getting used to um, a, a kind of ugly music? Um, I admire um, our Canadian friend, Quarrington, who plays in, in fifths. And I, I think it was the sixth suite in a very musical way. And then I think, oh my God, he is able to play it as an artist. Mm -hmm. And we have still many colleagues that play it as uh, showing muscle. And I can play many notes. Yeah. What do we want? Yeah, but the, the other day, somebody sent me uh, a YouTube and there was a, a girl playing some piece and apparently she was never been, uh, she never had, was never taught on the double bass. She picked the double bass for I don't know what reason and it was musical and, and easy and fun. It was wonderful. So uh, sometimes it, it's just natural if, if somebody has a natural musicality and finds his or her way with the instrument, you get wonderful results. So do you mean the, the French girl that won the competition when we yeah, went? No. I don't mean her. In her case, it was a very nice. a base event here, and it was a yeah. French girl where her parents were blind. Was that it? She played yeah. really her by Her mother was blind, and she was uh, she wanted to play the double bass as a young girl. And then the parents, well, the double bass, I mean, being a girl and not so tall, maybe it's better if you try the viola. That's fun, too. So she picked up the viola, and she played it for, for a year, and then she said, no, that's not what I want. And she went back to the double bass and she won our competition. Wow. Yes. Well, I, 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 I'm, I'm picturing you guys, just I'm thinking back to what we were chatting about a few minutes ago, I'm picturing you guys toasting champagne at the front of the plane and <laughs> with their double bases and getting pulled over by the police as you're driving through, you know, and, and places, you know, it's funny, this, this country uh, that I live in here, how, I mean, it's all one country, but you were talking about El Paso, Texas. That's a totally different world than Olympia, Washington, or here in San Francisco or New York. I mean, what, what do uh, you already, you already shared a few of like, of pretty outstanding stories. Do you have any other favorite moments, either highs or lows of life on the road? <laughs> My favorite story, I don't have to hesitate one second, <laughs> is that we we, had, we were staying in Chicago with uh, Joe Wastafesta. Uh, Wastafesta, uh, yeah. And uh, we, had a, we were shooting out to uh, another place where we, Illinois State University, where we're going to give a recital. And a and, uh, okay, so off to the air, airport and uh, in, into the plane. But uh, you want to take these? And uh, they didn't want to have them in the same plane. We, we were supposed to put them as freight. They had to be carried as freight. I don't know exactly what happened, but anyway, it, it all ended up with us being at the very moment that we were supposed to play. We were only uh, running at the, uh, at the campus and with our uh, big cases. And we had sent the music to the pianist, but so we ran on stage and the, oh, the audience was there and we opened our cases and I took the basses, stools, bup, 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 the pianist was ready and pip, off we went with the recital and it was great fun uh, to play and it, the pianist was very attentive and was a good, good musician, so it was wonderful. So we could only... Uh, <sighs> relax after the concert and, uh, and then but the story wasn't over because uh, after all this uh, we uh, we made our way back to Chicago and here was another tragedy no 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 we this is freight this is freight and you have to uh, bring them there I don't know I don't know what happened anyway we arrived in um, in Chicago and we found the place where, where the double bases had ended up being transported as freight and here came the bill, and uh, Hans is uh, very good, and I, I'm, sometimes I am a bit fluffy with money, although I changed to the good, but Hans said, what, do we have to pay extra? No, oh, nonsense, we had all this discomfort, and now we need to pick up our instruments, and you want us to pay this? Ridiculous, we're not gonna pay that. 
oh, oh, you're not going to pay that. Well, then you can't take the instruments. You can't take the instruments. So we, we sat there and waited for something to happen, and, and nothing happened. So uh, the the guy at the at the counter uh, went to to take his lunch, and it was free, and the instruments were there. So Hans said to me, "Come on, Rudolf, this is our moment." And we grabbed the instrument. But here came this little creep girl. Ah, they're stealing! They're stealing! I'm stealing! I'm Phone the police. And here our taxi was waiting, and the instruments were in the taxi already. Big, big uh, Impala Chevrolet. And here came the police. Few cars pulling up. It had. It was night in the meantime. It was late at night. They had. They had their lights on. You know. It was like. Huh, we were in. A, we were in a series. What is this? And we were in, in the taxi. And the, the, the police said, oh, "Don't you get?" And the taxi driver said, "No, don't get out of the taxi. They'll. They'll. They'll treat you badly." No, no, no. We're in the. We're in the taxi. I will talk to them. So uh, he opened the window and then. But it was it was quite quite something. This uh, it took us hours, but uh, I never wanted to miss that story. <laughs> and we didn't pay. We didn't pay. We never paid. I, I remember the the phrase that the car that the taxi driver used. Sir, you're slightly overstating your authority. To <laughs> oh, <yeah>. oh. <laughs> the policeman, you're overstating. Your we, uh, Jason, the problem was that we had normally a voucher, so we had bought a ticket, and then there was a voucher for the instruments. But sometimes uh, officials behind the desk said, no way, this is impossible, and this is cargo in the time that we didn't have the aluminum cases. And then sometimes uh, I had to say, well, you know, if we miss our next concert, we're going to sue your company. Yeah. Because you, uh, on the you way, have to pay for the damages. Yeah. On the way to a city, everything was OK. On the way back, there was an official in the uh, sitting behind the desk, desk, and he would say, no way, this is impossible. And then you had to use uh, legal threats to get uh, in on the plane and to be uh, back in time for the next concert. So that made us actually, it made it a bit stressful. And that's why we had these custom made uh, cases. But then in the case of, uh, that was from Austin, Texas, that uh, this man was also criticizing. Normally we use these uh, aluminum cases as excess luggage. And when this guy protested, no, that is not excess luggage, this is cargo, and it should be sent separately. And then it would be the next day uh, in uh, Chicago. So we always had, uh, in that case, we had to put up a verbal fight to get what we wanted, or else our schedule would be uh, under threat or uh, in danger that we could perform. So then uh, that was the less comfortable side about people using, uh, lower people using their authority and making things difficult. I must say to their, uh, to their uh, wait, um, defense. Uh, defense that the uh, cases were very, very heavy, 45 oh. kilograms each. And uh, now if we have to travel, then you have these uh, phone uh, cases and the whole thing weighs is truly an ex extra suitcase because the whole thing weighs uh, what 15 kilograms or something it's very lightweight and uh, so now uh, it's less troublesome now actually Rudolf when I travel to uh, Brazil um, the total weight is 18 kilos 9 kilos the instrument and, uh, and another 9 for uh, the bows the end pin and the and the, the case. Yeah. Before we would always put our stools inside and music. So then it added up to 60 kilos in the aluminum cases. Yeah. But they have another word and that is dimensional weight. Oh yes. Yeah. And you always have to. Uh, sometimes you make a good deal, and another time you meet somebody that says yes, but length and width and. Uh, yeah. Discussions. And, yeah. and they speak about dimensional weight. And while you say, look, the other guy is having skis and that one is having a bicycle, don't make it difficult. Yeah. So it, it, it is, you, we've been together last time to uh, 
Colorado. Yeah. That, so we had to pay more, huh? and you were all a little more. I was of the lead because uh, I was a little earlier on the on yeah. the airfield, and I I had arranged that it. They were only uh, uh, charged as extra suitcases, and I, I was all set and ready. And then if you if you go to that counter, then you can pay for the extra suitcases. But there was another lady, and she she knew the difficulty that uh, our uh, KLM uh, air carrier was in, and uh, she wanted to be good. She said, "No, no, 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 no way! This is not. This is too big. It's not an extra yeah. suitcase." And, but uh, the girls that I that had helped me in, in the other counter had already given me the, uh, the the paperwork so that so that I could simply drop off the instruments. So, so okay, I said uh, then uh, then I'm sorry, uh, it's your choice, and I walked on and I was able to uh, wave to Hans this way, <laughs> and here we went. So it was uh, this time it was free of charge. It was even better. But, uh, yeah. Was it last time we went to uh, Stockholm and, and uh, Lithuania? Yeah, that was yeah. in the same uh, same year. Yeah, uh, it turns out that uh, Norwegian. Norwegian eh? has special, uh, yes, but Norwegian has special mention of the double bases. No more than two double bases in a single flight. <laughs> <laughs> that's, per that's perfect for you. That, that's perfect. That's <laughs> Well, it's yeah that that on, that unpredictability of travel is so frustrating, right? I mean, even just bringing I I I I never bring my base these days, but even just bringing my bow, you know, um, oh, that's you know, it's 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 nothing, especially when you're talking about other things coming on the plane. But yeah, to be to have it be perfectly fine one direction and then not be able to make it or running to your concert or it's uh, hey, I, I I I am so. Glad to be able to connect with both of you guys. I I, I really appreciate you doing this. Um, uh, I'm 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 gonna have to split because I got a I got an 8 a.m. uh co conference call. But um, if there's anything you want me to use in terms of music or anything, just let me know and I can put a little bit at the beginning and end. Uh, it's been a it's been a little while since I've been to uh Amsterdam or Rotterdam, but I have been and I'm I, I'll be back. <laughs> After after this is all, so I'd love to, I'd love to meet you guys in person, or if you ever uh, had, had find yourself on on this side of the United States anytime soon, please let me know. Hans, Rudolf, thank you guys. Let's do it again in person. Would be even better someday soon, but I had a great time. I love doing this show for reasons like this, just getting to connect with people who I've known their names for years and just to find out about what's going on with them right now, where they are in their part of the world, and of course, what they've done and so many great stories of traveling on with a base. If you've done any of that, I'm sure you can relate to what they were talking about. And thank you for listening. I totally appreciate it. If you've made it to the end, you are a true fan. So thank you for being in that fun club. I think it's a fun club. And again, International Online Base Summit, check it out if you can. And if you've signed up already, we're really looking forward to having you there. BaseSummit.org. Uh, what else to say? I don't even know. Uh, it's getting into June here. I can't believe I've been sitting in my house for a uh, quarter of a year <laughs> <laughs> staring out the same window, but I guess that's what's happening to me. Likely happening to you, wherever you are. Maybe things are loosening up a little bit where you're at. Uh, not really here in San Francisco, but time will tell. So, anyway, enough of that. And just thank you for listening. I really appreciate it. And I want to thank the Contrabass Conversations team. Michael Cooper, Steve Hinchy, Trevor Jones, Mitch Mooring, and Krista Copper. And Mitch makes beautiful bases in the Dallas-Fort Worth area area just east of there he won an award a silver medal i believe for tone at the last international society of basis convention and you can learn more at mitchmooring.com by the way that music that you hear at the beginning at the end and you've heard for over 700 episodes that is me 
But more importantly, that's Eric Hochberg playing the pizz- the the, 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 the pizzicato. I can't talk the pizzicato that opens and closes all these episodes. So shout out to Eric and check out his website at erichochberg.com. I'm going to put that in the links for the show notes for this one and going forward. So thanks, Eric. Thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jason Heath, and we'll see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. Thank you.